church planning, it's kind of like, it's not that difficult. It's like you're walking on a tightrope 500 feet up in the air. And beneath you, there's barbed wire if you fall that you could hit. And then on the barbed wire, there's uh, the Niagara Falls. And in Niagara Falls, there's, you know, man-eating shark and fish. Other than that, it's not that difficult at all. <laughs> but I like it a lot to walk in on a tightrope because when a person's walking on a tightrope, the balance and the tension of that tightrope is the danger because if they get off balance, they could fall. But they stay in balance, they're safe. And Proverbs 11 and 1 says, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And as you see in your lesson, I say that bivocational pastors suffer most from a lack of time and a lot of tension in their life. You know, I, I try to do some research on how many pastors in the U.S. are bivocational, not full-time in, in the ministry, as we call it. And the numbers range between 65 and 80 percent. But how many of this room work a job outside of what we consider full-time ministry? Raise your hand. So look around the room. You see those numbers are pretty accurate. And myself, you know, when I, my wife and I started the church, you know, we worked. And as um, Brother Tony said, I looked at it as full-time ministry. Matter of fact, it would confuse people sometimes. They would ask me, are you in full-time ministry? Are you full-time in ministry? And when I'm thinking, I would say yes. Then a few minutes later, they find out I worked a job. They'd be like, well, I thought you said you were full-time. I, I consider myself full-time. Even when I was a manager working for a Fortune 100 company, I looked at my job as my, part of my ministry, you know. And, and I think the problem with church planners many times is we wear too many hats. And like you have a hat in your closet, one says husband, you know, one says father, one says pastor, you know, one says my job, and you go to the closet every day, which hat am I going to wear today and for how many hours I'm going to wear? You should have one hat, just have your name on it. This is who I am. This is what I do. And, and so my proposal to you today is what if the various tensions in your life pulled you together in perfect balance instead of pulling you apart? You see, because if you look at it as one thing that you do, you know, because you feel like sometimes, well, if I spend time with my wife, that helps my marriage when the church suffers. If I spend time with the church, then my job suffers. You know, if I spend time and try to be a good father, then my marriage suffers. Like everything you do, it's like one thing is against the other. And tension is a state of just simply being stretched too tight. And many church planners live their lives in that way. My proposal to you is those tensions, use them to keep you on balance to do what God has called you to do. You know, give you a good example. In life, you get tired, you get hungry, you got a family at home. Well, I'm the type of person, my wife will attest, if I didn't get tired, if I didn't get hungry, and if I didn't have a wife that has my cell phone number and not afraid to use it, I'd go to work on a Monday morning, get focused, and be Thursday afternoon before I realized, hey, you know, it's Thursday, I hadn't seen my family in four days. I could be so focused on a project, but because I get tired, I get hungry and my phone rings. Oh, it's five o'clock. I better go home. But that keeps me in balance because if not for that, then I would get on one thing and just focus on that and be out of balance. If I can interject, I have never worked that hard in my life. <laughs> well, your wife, your wife was telling us that back there a few minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she didn't mention that. So, um, and I never did work that hard. I just, just sounded good. It's My wife's here, so I got to be more truthful. It's sounded be more really truthful. good. I stop and eat often. I'd have never done that. Yeah. <laughs> so I look at those things as how can I stay in balance? You see on your paper there, I gave you a scale. On one side of the scale, we have self-care, vacation, study, time with your spouse and family. The other side, your ministry, your members, finances, job, and church. And how do you balance all of this? Well, the Bible says a false balance is abomination to the Lord. And that's speaking more of like a farmer or somebody selling crops. So if God says it's abomination to me, if a farmer has a false balance to his customers, how much of abomination is it when you're cheating your wife? And you're cheating your kids. You're cheating your church because you're having a false balance. I believe it's God's will for us to be in balance. The word promises God would not put more on you than what you're able to bear. But in, this ain't parentheses, except for church planners. I, didn't it say that in there? It's the message. Yeah, it said that, except everybody else can handle what God, but you know, church planners, we're the only ones that we have so much on our plate that we can't handle it. But the, the Bible says, take up your cross daily and follow me. 
You know, and the Bible says he won't put more than what you ate. So I believe our job is to be in balance. You know, you can only be effective putting force in one direction. You know, God's the only one that can send out force 360 degrees around him and affect the whole world. But we, we're limited. We can only be effective one direction, going one way at a time. And when you're so scattered and you're trying to do everything and wear too many hats, you find yourself out of balance. And so you have to make a decision in your mind as to your ministry, your family, and you, you make up your mind and say, I'm not going to cheat anybody out of it. And there's ways you can do it now. You know, when we were very busy. My wife can attest to that at one point. You know, I had my own business. I had a wife. had a family. I held a district position. was on the general board. I was deputy honorary mayor in my town. That's just the stuff my wife knew what I was doing. The rest of the stuff I did, she didn't even know what I was involved with. And we don't believe in secrets, so we want to say that <laughs> as well. So I need to go into everything I was doing. But in the midst of all of that, I worked for a Fortune 100 company, 23 employees, $34 million budget. I took my kids to school every day and picked them up. That was my commitment to them. Now, the one time a month they had to ride the school bus, you'd have thought you know, they were ready to call 911. <laughs> but pretty much until from kindergarten to the time they could drive to school, I, I would drive them to school every day and pick them up and bring them home. That was, it was that commitment, that was our time together. And that's how important it was to me to spend that time together. My wife and I eventually figured out that we had to schedule a date night. So it doesn't sound romantic to schedule a date night, but Tuesday night was gonna be date night. No matter what was going on, no Bible studies would be taught, nothing else going on, that was gonna be our time together. And so you, you have to set boundaries in your life. You've got to decide what's important. You gotta live your life by what's important. There were times I turned down promotions that would have doubled and tripled my salary because it would upset my balance. It would, it, I'd make more money, but it would take time for the ministry or time for my family. So if these things are really important to you, you have to start making decisions and living your life in a way that says, this is what's important to me. I'm called to be a church planner. I'm working this job, but there's unsafe people in the job. I'm getting paid to go and win them. And so instead of looking at it, I have all these hats to wear. I have one hat to wear. I got to reach my city, but it's up with the kingdom of God. And involve your family in what you do. You know, my daughter, the other day my daughter was talking about when I started my business. She was like, you know what? All those nights in the game room, filing. I didn't know dad was starting a business. It was just a game that I thought they were playing. You know, you want to, hey, let's go have a water fight. Oh, let's watch the church van, you know, while we're having a water fight. You know, make it fun. You know, my wife started a fun game one time. Is It was called, who wants a hobby or a game? It was like, who wants to learn to play the piano? So mine would have to sing with, sing with soundtracks anymore. So that was a fun game. And my daughter's like, well, I'm only 11. And my wife's like, well, guess what? I just looked at it, rules 11. You just, it's 11 and up. You can learn to play the piano. And mommy don't have to play sing with soundtracks no more. <laughs> You make your family part of what, they, they don't know this work. They don't know, what, they're just making part of what you're, it becomes part of what it is. You know, Mike Williams' daughter, Rory Hills, or something with my girls years ago that helped them. She told them, listen, when we started, this church was very small in the Popka. She says, every week I taught Sunday school. I led praise and worship. I never had a Sunday off. And she says, and as big as our church is now, I do the same thing I always did. She said, you know, I, lead, I teach Sunday school every week. I, I'm on the praise team every week. And she says, you know why? It's, I didn't do that back then because our church was small. I did that because God called our family to church planning. Good. So even when the, fam when the church is bigger and you have more people, God call you, God call your wife, God call, make them part of the journey, make it fun, make it a family event. So everything you do, it's not about, I gotta choose between time with the church, time with the family. You know, you do need separate family time. Let me understand what I'm saying, you know? You need to go on vacation, you know? You need to take, the, the church is not gonna fall apart. God's church was here before you were born. At least one week a year, you need to go away and have vacation with you and your kids and get away, it'll be just fine. You need to do that. You know, and I worry sometimes when church planners don't even have somebody to babysit their kids for a date night. They'll be fine. Your kids are going to leave you one day. You think, yeah, they're going to they're gonna look at you one day and say, bye, mom, bye, dad. We got our own family. You need to work on your, so these things, but you got to make priorities in your life. Have a few scriptures I'm going to share on that. Amen. In your lesson, it says 1 Samuel 17, 47. What, remember, what all battles are the Lord's. This, this church planning is not, it's God's battle. 
So don't put everything on you that you got to figure it out. It's on you. The battle belongs to God. It's not your battle. It's God. So let God help you and give you wisdom to fight. It's not you yourself. It's God's battle. Second thing is what you treasure will determine your values. For where your treasure is, it's where your heart will be also. So I made decisions in my life. You know, money, career, other people were not going to take the place of my family, of what's important to me. Now, I had a rule. This is one thing I learned. God called me, and my wife followed me. So when, when things went wrong, I got mad at God. When things didn't go right, my wife sometimes got mad at me because she was following me, also following God, but following me and my family. I had a rule in my church. I had an open door. You can criticize me about anything except my family. They're here because of me. They were off limits. And I protected them. But you, you, you got you to have your treasure to determine your values. Then your values will determine your priorities. If you walk uprightly, you're going to walk surely, Proverbs 10 and, and, and 9. So when you have your priorities right, your values right, then you can make better decisions. Some of you are more worried about other pastors think about than what your kids think about you. I don't have time to get into that today. But if your kids are really what's important to your family, put them first. Have the right values. The last scripture is your priorities will influence your decision making. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Psalms 25 and 12, the Lord would teach you in the way that you should choose. So now, when you remember the battles are God's, you got financial struggles, you know, you have things on your job, things in the church, things in your family, things in your marriage. Battle belongs to God. Your treasure is in the right place. You have the right priorities. You can start making better decisions. So it's not either or, it's both. And that's God's will. I don't think your family should suffer because you're a church planner. Your marriage should suffer because you're a church planner. You should come together. One last thing I'll share, and we're going to look at this last chart that I'm going to turn over to Brother Youngblood. You know, when I first got married, I made the mistake of thinking, you know what? When my, I felt like my wife wasn't with me. Bless God, I'm going to build a church. So I'm just going to run way ahead of her because she's so unspiritual. She don't know I'm building a church and leave her behind me. And God spoke to me and said, you know what? You're one now. You're not ahead of her, and she, you better go back there and get her. Because you're one now. And I had to learn. There was a reason my wife wasn't with me because I was trying to go too fast and do too much. I had to slow down and say, let's do this together. Hand in hand, let's work together as a team. So I don't believe it has to be your job or ministry. It has to be your family or the church. It has to be this or this. When you're in balance, it all goes together. So the last thing I'm going to do before I turn it over, to, I have to talk first because, you know, he's a lot funnier and things. So if I don't go first, you won't listen to me. <laughs> but... I want to challenge you. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I want you to look at this chart at the bottom of, of your page there. It's numbered in the middle from 0 to 10. And I want you to put a dot on each one of these areas. The first one is your personal walk with God. Where are you at in your personal walk with God? Your time you spend in devotion. Where are you at with God? Not just, you know, Sunday morning, you know, looking online for a message. It been your personal walk with God. The second one is your relationship with your spouse. Maybe let your spouse grade you, because you might think you're doing better than zero to ten. How are you doing with your relationship with your spouse? You know, you know when's the last time you bought your wife a flower that didn't go in the oven, you know, to bake something? <laughs> Amen. The next one is your family. Where are you at with your family, with your kids? You know, zero to ten. Put a dot on that line. How's, how are things are going with your church, your ministry, your church? You know, how are your church members you know, are you spending time? Are you discipling people? Are you leading people? The one on the bottom, what about your career since you work, your business? How's that going? Zero to ten. Your personal fitness, so easy when you're young to forget about, you know, taking, eating right, taking care of yourself. But how are you doing with that? Zero to ten. Your finances, your savings. You know, church planners, we put our life on the line financially. But one day you're going to retire or get old unless the rapture happens. What are you doing about your financial future? Then the last one, what's your connection with other ministers, mentors. You, 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 you need to be careful. You, your best friend can't be in your church. You need to pastor those people. You need friends. That's why you come to this, to make friends. You need to have a, you need, you need to have a mentor in your life, a pastor that can speak to you. I'll tell church, if you, if you don't have a pastor, if your wife don't have their number, can call without your permission and turn you in. If there's no one in your life, your wife can call and say, he's messing up, you don't have a pastor. So you need someone in your life above you, some peers. And then I want you to do is take a circle and connect those dots together. I'd rather you be all threes, all fives, all six. What I don't want you to do is be eight here, two here, four here. A tire can't roll out of balance. 
And if you rate yourself as a 10-year walk with God, but a three with your spouse, there's a problem there. And it's going to show up sooner or later. And when you're out of balance, you won't be able to function long. So the key is look at these areas and see where you're. And then I ask you six questions. Where are you the most out of balance? What principles do I need to learn to strengthen this area? Are there any rules I'm breaking? You know, and am I sacrificing my family and my spouse to build a church? What is my next step to get in balance? I need an accountability partner. You need to go to someone and say, Pastor, I'm out of balance. I'm a two in my marriage right now. I got to get to a 10. I need you to help me get there. I got to spend some time with my wife. That's my most important, talking about a team, your spouse is your most important team member. And then what are you going to do to start getting back in balance today, right now? So you're not going to be successful as a pastor, but especially as a bivocational pastor if you are out of balance. So stop feeling sorry for yourself. God called you to pastor a church and use the tensions in your life to keep you in balance, to keep you walking that tightrope. So you're not leaning one way or the other. Stop fighting the tension. Invite the tension in. Okay, God, I got a job. I got a church. I got a family. I got this. Help me balance all of this. Let me stay in balance. Let me walk uprightly before you. I'm not going to sacrifice my family, my marriage, my future, my financial future. You know, one last thing I'll say that I promise I'm going to shut up. And let, once he talks, it's over for me. We started the church with a budget of $800 a month. The Lord worked a miracle. A few years later, we're sitting in the building of $4,000 a month. I was sitting there stressed out trying to pay them. And God said to me, when would you stop trusting me? Yeah. When it was $800 a month, I took care of you. So you got out here now, quadrupled your budget. I know it's because of growth, but I took my trust off of God, created financial stress on my family, and got out of balance in that area. Josh Youngblood, Little M, Texas. Thank you, Brother Stewart. Great stuff. Great stuff. I'll be honest with you. Um, I feel a little bit like a mosquito at a nudist colony. Um, I'm not sure where to start, but I'm glad to be here. And so uh, looking at being bivocational. Sorry about that. That's the last joke I have. Um, Someone I don't believe that. But I've always... You know, looking at having a job, I've always worked. I was in the model industry for about 20 years and uh, did a lot of modeling. And now, as a church plant, my career has shifted. And so, I am I'm currently working as a bank vice president. And uh, just when you look at this, I guess looking at your job as a minister, I'll tell you how I got this job at the bank. And um, I was interviewing for positions, trying to get to uh, the DFW area. We, we planted a church in Little Elm, which is in the northwest corner of Dallas. And uh, started applying for jobs and uh, had lots of lots of no's, lots of interviews that didn't go well. Um, I don't know why. And so a couple of, a couple of jokes were ill-timed probably in that process. Um, but I'll never forget that God opened a door for us. And um, I was interviewing for a position at a bank that was going to be about 45 minutes from uh, Little Elm. And my final interview was with the president of the bank, and he found out we were starting a church. And so he ended up, they, they came to me with an offer and said, what we decided to do was we're going to move a vice president out of Little Elm and move them 45 minutes away because we want you to be where God wants you to be. And so that's an amazing thing how God has worked things out and God's brought us together uh, in that market. And so I think when you look at your job, if you'll view your job as a ministry, which is a challenge every Monday, but if you will view your job as a ministry, right, that God has called you to an area and God's called you to plant in a field and that entire field is your responsibility. You think about the, par the parable of the treasure, uh, he bought the whole field, right? He didn't just buy the spot that had the treasure. And so um, when you're looking at that, when you view your job as a ministry, it'll, it'll change the way you look at it. Uh, that we're called in Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 16, you know, we're, we're called to be salt and we're called to be light and we're called to impact our field. And so uh, one of the first things I would say to you um, is that if you're going to have a job, you're probably going to. Is there, is there a question? All right. Paul, you want us to stop here until you get your stuff together? How do you want us to play this? It's fine. Yeah. So mosquitoes. <laughs> so, so well done. So well done. I feel right at home now. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just get back to my notes if you guys have time for that. Um, but if you're going to have a job, if you're going to have a job when you're planning a church, I would recommend that you get a job that's local to the field that God's calling you to, right? That you're not trying to work 45 minutes to an hour away. And there's multiple reasons why that's beneficial. The first one um, is that working in your field will allow you to meet people that live in your community, right? And that's, that's your target. Like you're wanting to meet.
meet people that are in your community. Um, and I can tell you at our church, you know, we've had lots of people visit our church um, and, and, and we've had people come from, you know, it's remarkable. People in our church, they, their coworkers are coming and the people that they are, their neighbors are coming. And that's really how you're going to build a church. That's how you're going to make these contacts. You can send mailers all day and we've done it. Uh, you can knock on doors, you can do all sorts of things, but it's still that personal invite. Um, and so often that comes from, you know, your first, your first captive audience really is going to be the people you work with. Now, I'm not saying that you need to start teaching a Bible study all day, every day, you may lose that job. And so that's not what we're saying. Um, but people at the bank have come to, to church. In our very first preview service, one of our one of the employees at the bank came to church with us. And we've had several that have visited our church and also bank customers. Um, and that's a unique skill. Somebody that comes into your office overdrawn and very upset about, about that. Uh, if you can calm them down and invite them to church at the end, that's a solid win. Uh, what you cannot do there are federal regulations. You cannot promise to waive overdraft fees in return for a church visit. That is something you cannot do. Um, and so Thank I, you. Yeah, no, I just want to clarify that. Um, you should not get arrested for launch training. Um, but that's really where if you're working in your community, that's how you're going to meet so many people. Um, and also working in your field allows you to build those relationships. And we have some of our team here uh, today, and the, the, sometimes they roll their eyes on Sunday afternoon because we always try to go eat lunch together. And y'all, I'm always trying to eat in Little Elm. Like I, I want to be, this is the field that God called us to. And so I am always trying to, let's go eat in our community. Let's be in our field. In fact, when Shell and I were, before we even moved to Little Elm, so many weekends, we just wanted to be there, that we were just going to get in the car and drive and, and we just just wanted to be in Little Elm, and, and we wanted to eat the restaurants there, and just wanted to get into our field. And so, um, your job gives you that opportunity. Your job connects you with so many people, um, and, and relationships build trust, right? And so, it's important. Now, if you're going to treat people, if you're not going to treat people right, don't get a job in your town. Go to the next town. Okay, get. And if you're not going to tip the waitress, don't eat in your town. Eat next at the next town, right? Um, but as you build this trust, people get to know you, people start trusting you, and before you know it, they're going to start coming to your church, um, and they're going to start visiting your church, and even if it takes a while for them to come in person, like even right now in our, in our current context, um, COVID uh, forced us out of the box, and it forced us to start going online for our church services, right? And, um, you know, we have people now that are coming in person that watched online for weeks at a time, months at a time, and it's so, it's so interesting how they, even they haven't visited yet, but we have city council members that are currently watching every Sunday night. And we have these people that are watching and they're viewing these things. And some of it goes all the way back to, you know, us being in our community, us making an impact there. Really, if God calls you to a field, you should want the whole field to succeed, right? You want your businesses and your town to do well. And so when you're working a job, the second point I'll share with you, when you're working a job, you are building credibility with your congregation. Because you're easier to follow when you have shared experiences and when you have shared life circumstances. Uh, we've talked a lot about it when you have children and you have uh, families in your church with kids. You're very much, you're relatable because of your kids, right? You're relatable because parenting is hard. So par parenting is hard, right? If you have kids, there are some days where you feel like you understand what you're doing and there's other days that you do not, in fact, feel like you know what you're doing. And so that, that shared life experience, a job is another aspect of that. You can get up on Sunday and you're authentic when you say that you're tired, right? You're authentic when you say that there are some things, you know, I can talk about Monday coming because everyone understands like Monday morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to work. And so when you have these things, you know, it makes you easier to follow because they're aware that you have similar life examples. Now, this is not throwing shade at anybody that's, that's not currently working a job, but sometimes, and not none of you people, I've just heard of it in other places, but sometimes a pastor on a Wednesday night uh, can, can want to go for two and a half hours or three hours or four. Um, again, not you, but it's, and so you understand that when you are also going to get up the next morning early and go to work, right? That you're, you're more cognizant of the limitations in the room and you're aware, hey, that maybe this ought to be a series. Maybe I ought to break this down and we can take this out instead of me going for the next four hours because everybody's got to get up. It's the same when you have kids, right? You understand. And if you don't, your wife is in the back, like, like, like <laughs> not Shelly. I'm saying for other people, we've never had this experience. <laughs> She's waving her watch right now. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, you went 42 minutes. I get eight. Okay, so let's take it easy there. So, what? what that, that was. I'm sorry. He's he's a director of promotions. I want to apologize. <laughs> But when you're working a job, it, it, it gives you this credibility where you can't, you have similar experiences and they, you're easier to follow because you're relatable. And I've gotten feedback from our church. They understand, listen, that I, I, know, I know the frustration of working for somebody, 
right? Um, that every, every boss you have is not a gift from God. Um, some bosses are uh, just an opportunity for you to grow as a person and for your devotion uh, and prayer to grow as well. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, this is practical. Having an outside job removes some of the financial pressure from the equation. Not all of it, but it helps. Um, when you have a steady income stream, uh, the size of the offering has no bearing on your week personally. Think about that. You know, when you're first getting started, you know, you're tracking all the numbers. You're tracking the attendance. And really, you're always, as a pastor, you're always tracking all the numbers, right? You know the attendance, but you also, you're tracking the offering as well. And I'm thankful that from the very beginning of our church, you know, we understood that I'm going to have a job and I'm going to be working. We have income that's coming in. So if, if, you know, if you're celebrating the wins for the day, you don't have to be bummed out because the offering was small. Because you're still going to be able to eat. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. You always, you know, you want the offering to, to continue to, to climb, but it's not going to, it's not going to change the dynamic of your week where you're not sitting there thinking, man, I, you know, we're not gonna be able to eat this week and I'm sorry, you know, the boys are hungry and they look like little orphan Annie and they're, they're you know, you're going to be okay because you've got income stream that's coming in. There are plenty of things to stress about on Sunday. Plenty of things in a healthy way because we talked about boundaries and balance. Uh, there, there's plenty of healthy things for you to stress about. But when you are when you have outside income coming in, then, then you have that pressure off of yourself to make sure you don't have to take up the offering eight times. Um, and if you're doing that, please do not do that again. That's not what should be happening on Sunday. <laughs> when you are a pastor as a wage earner, there are two benefits from the, for your church, right? That your tithes and offerings support the church. Now, I'll just say this, and this is, I know this is, everybody understands this, but if you're not giving to your church, uh, don't ask anyone else to, right? right? If, if you're not personally investing, if you're not putting your tithing offering in, in the bucket, you know, please, please stop asking for everyone else to give because they're following your example. Um, another thing, too, that uh, is our, our, our church has benefited because I had an outside job. You know, we were able to save quickly. We were able to save some money. And so uh, when COVID happened and we got that call from the school district you know, in March the uh, 15th, March the 13th, we got this notice from the school that we could not have service. And we were locked out of our building. And uh, you know they were so concerned about all the things. And we understand it was a difficult time for everybody. But we understood, okay, now we're going to start looking for a space that we can lease. We're going to start looking for something we can jump into. And when we found it, we found a CrossFit gym. And I was excited about working out between services, but we had to use all the space. And so we ended up renovating the entire space. Uh, and that was something that, that had, had our church had to cover a full-time salary for me and my family, and I have two boys, and they eat a ton. Um, and so had our church been covering a full-time salary from the beginning, we would not have had the assets that we had to renovate a space. And so that was something that, that you know, that was, that we were very fortunate as a church that we had these resources to, to, to finish out a remodel job. Uh, because, you know, if you've not done that yet, I'll just tell you, those are super fun, uh, the remodel jobs. Um, <laughs> You'll have a great time with that. It's a lot of work. And also, uh, it always costs way more than you thought initially. So just plan for that as well. There's a testimony here. Um, if they tell you one figure, they're, they're not, it's not telling the truth. It's going to cost more than that. Um, and, you know, well, I'm not going to say that. That's the Holy Ghost helping me right there. I want to thank God for his grace. Um, <laughs> But your church is able to save for the future. And so I'll tell you, in our church, you know, we, we are two and a half years old. So we're just now, we're, we're still a baby church and we're figuring things out. We'll be three years old uh, May, in May. And we, we have seen the favor of God, the blessings of God. And, you know, my job has not one time hindered our church right? That not one time has it hindered what God was trying to do. I've been able to meet people in our community. Um, in fact, when we launched our church, we started in a, in a school. And uh, just to give you an idea, if you've, if you've priced that, um, those, are, those are, normally they're cheaper options, but they're not always super cheap, right? That you can actually pay quite a bit of money for a school. And because of my job, because the God had opened the store for my job, I had uh, served on a committee and I had met the, the superintendent for Little Elm and we got to be friends. And, and then he put me on a committee for the school district. And so here I am, I've been in my town for six months and now I'm on a steering committee for the district and I'm helping give input on curriculum and teacher hires and principals and, and uh, the, all the things for the school district. And so because of that, he approached me. And initially we were doing six months of preview services and we were paying uh, $400 a Sunday, which is a remark. That's a fantastic rate if you've priced it. $400 a Sunday is fantastic. And we were setting up before church and teared down after church. And so when we got ready to go to a weekly service, I understand, you know, I can do math because I'm a banker. And so you just start adding it up, it's going to be more expensive. Um, really, you just know more Sundays, more money. It's that kind of how it works uh, for those of you that don't are not good at math. And, and so I, he approached me at a meeting we were at as, at a board meeting and said, listen, I'm concerned about your church. And I said, hey, me too. You know, like... <laughs> 
It's both of us. And he said, I, I don't want you to, I don't want it to be a, a burden for you financially. So what, we're, what we decided to do is let me see what we can do. We're going to work on that. And he said, I've also noticed from social media that you're setting up before church before you preach, and then you have to tear it all down immediately afterwards. So let me see what we can do on that. And so they came back and decided that what they were going to do, they actually um, decided for our first year or so that we paid uh, just under, we paid $360 a month for the school. And he said, we're going to make sure that you're able to set up on Saturday night. That way you're not exhausted on Sunday. And so it, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that God did. And, and that door really was because there was a professional relationship with the school superintendent because I had a job and the bank was paying me to get out and meet people and be in the community. Uh, Pastor Tony mentioned it earlier. You know, if you have a job, it's like you're being paid as an outreach director. You're being paid to meet people. And that's just one example. But I've seen those things happen across the board. And, and so because of that, you know, as a church planner, you're, you know, we started off, it was all, it was the bad news bears. Everybody that was coming to our church, you know, we're, we're trying to put people back together. But as you reach for everybody, right, as you reach for the ones that nobody wants, and we've seen that, we've heard that several times today, that God will also start pushing people to you that everybody wants. And, and so we're not at Grace Church. We believe that everyone should, should uh, not miss out on the grace of God. And so that's something we talk about every time we gather. We talk about it every time with our team is because if we truly believe that, then we're going to reach for those that have nothing and we're going to reach for those that have everything. Right? That we're going to span the spectrum. And because of that, it's, you don't be intimidated as a church planner to go after people of influence in your community. Don't, don't be intimidated to, to, to witness to those people as well and invite them to your service as well. And a, and a lot of times those connections happen on a professional level when you are willing to, to get out, when you're willing to work a job and you're willing to just look at every opportunity as a chance for you to highlight your church. Um, I'm involved with the Chamber of Commerce in Little Elm and, you know, every meeting I'm at, we, we start, you know, you have a chance to highlight yourself and what you're a part of. And I always tell people like, hey, I'm Josh, I'm with, you know, Point Bank, but I'm also with Grace Church. We can help you with your faith or your finances. And I, I say that enough times that I, I have got people, you know, I'll get, a, I'll get a bank question, but I'll get a church question too. And I've had meetings where we're in the chamber of commerce and we're meeting with different ones and someone pulls me to the side. Can you pray for me right now? Absolutely. Because they know and understand, listen, this is a guy who's, he's, he's not just a banker, he's a pastor. And, and so when you can be a dual threat, you build equity quickly. Um, it, it's, you meet people in your, in your community that you would not ordinarily meet without a job. Um, it, it takes some of the financial pressure off of you and your church. And uh, I, I can't, you know, obviously this is my current context. So I can't tell you more uh, other than it's a, it's a benefit. It's a win all the way around.